Hello, and welcome to the Six Months to Six Figures series of the W Freelancing Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Swinehart, and I'm here with Brad today. And I'm going to be basically coaching him from where he's at now to these kind of early stages to earning six figures. That's what this series is all about. Uh, six figures, so like let's say $100,000 a year, breaks down to a little over $8,000 a month. And my challenge with Brad in this series is to see if I can get him to that consistent revenue point within six months. Uh, so in the series, Brad and I connect every couple weeks and sometimes every week. There are vacations, so every week or two. And it basically loosely follows the one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions within the DYF Accelerator community. So if you're sitting there thinking to yourself, oh, I wish I could get coaching like this, know that you totally can, and you can learn more at dyf.link slash dyfa. So let's dive into today's episode. So Brad, today is July 31st, and I was looking, it's been a long time since we chatted. July 5th was our last call. Wow, really? Yeah. So about three weeks since we last chatted, and I think where we left things a few weeks ago was that I was going to have you basically focusing on the Upwork lead gen strategy you're currently doing to see if we could solidify the metrics to know like how much time does it take to get a client, how much of that time has to be Brad, how much of that time could be outsourced, what's the cap on the amount of work you could get with your Upwork strategy. And uh, for those of you guys listening, Brad sent me a big update email about a week ago. So I'm going to have him give me the recap here. We're going to dive into that. Um, but before I get that whole recap and stuff, just to mirror the format we do in the accelerator and stuff, just to give me some context, what are you hoping to leave? And I'll do the little timer for us to, I'll try to just hold this up to remind us how much we got. Um, what are you hoping to leave today's session with, Brad? Um, just... Yeah, to to update you on what's happened since our last call and then get next steps, next direction from you. Okay. What would you say like the biggest business pain is right now? The biggest pain is still income. Um, and I know that's simple, but I guess it just means, yeah, since since we left, I've gotten one new client. Uh, a very small client, and that's it. So it's still, it's still getting, getting leads and clients, I guess. Okay. And I want to dive into that, but I guess I'll let you do the update first because it makes sense for the context. So I guess, do you have that email pulled up, and you can kind of paraphrase it for me and the audience here? Yes. Um. So you asked me basically how things were going since our previous call. Um, we did have overlapping vacations, so you took a vacation and then I took a vacation. So that's, that was interesting. Um, and the vacation for me was, as I said in the email, good for the soul, not so good for momentum or for the bank account. Um, I'm definitely not in a place where I can just, you know, take time off really. Yeah. And, but I had made this commitment to my girlfriend and, you know, it's more important to me to you know, live up to my commitments to people I care about than it is even to go through some financial hardships. So I tried to really be in the moment for the vacation, which was great. It was really fun. But, um, and I didn't think about work much, which is rare. Great. Yeah. So yeah, great for my soul, bad for momentum and bank account. That's what I said in the email. You also asked if I was feeling overwhelmed. And I guess before that, I was uh, trying to pretend that there wasn't an emotional component to this, but that's silly. And you, I think, rightly sort of prodded on that a bit. So you asked if I was feeling overwhelmed by all this, and I said, yes, actually, I've been feeling quite overwhelmed. I guess I was avoiding talking about emotional side. Uh, I said I'm slipping into a survival mode, thinking, like you mentioned in a post in the community, that you were feeling your own version of in, in a way. I'm sort of paraphrasing what you said, but you said something about feeling like fight or flight mode, mm -hmm. which is interesting to me because recently I've had a conversation, have had very similar conversations with a lot of my friends who I would consider very successful financially, business wise. And I hear the same sentiment, but it's like the numbers are just different. Mm. I've heard this from a lot of people. So that, that that's what I felt when I saw that from you too. It's like, man, to me, you're 
very successful and you're so much further along on this journey than I am. So it's interesting to hear that the emotions stay the same, even though the numbers can change. Yeah, I sometimes um, wonder about like how much it, it's a psychological habit versus how much it's contextual. Like the reason I think yeah. that I feel the overwhelm is the same reason you are, which is if I need to get DYF to a certain revenue level to outpace expenses and to afford staffing, like that puts me into that space versus in my own consultancy prior to coming on with DYF and stuff, I didn't get into fight or flight because I was just so far outpacing like my lifestyle financial needs and the business financial needs that it wasn't there. So yeah, I guess it is interesting to hear that you see that a lot. And I think for me, my fear is that like I've been reading Profit First and he talks about businesses that can grow into these like cash eating monsters. And my fear that I don't want to create for myself is getting to some state where there's like some seven figure business or eight figure business that still feels like that always a little bit behind fight or flight. Gotta get the money hustled. Oh, scary. Anyway, I digress. Keep going. Yes, um, that is a good thing to explore. I said, um, and I and I still feel this. I know I'm only a couple of clients away from things turning around. Like, I I did some solid client work the last couple of days, uh, just in Upwork, and even at my level, even with just the client, the the main client that I have now on Upwork, it's it's almost enough. Like, if I just do that, it's almost enough for me to at least establish that initial level of survival kind of stuff. So I'm so close. And if I get any more, you know, fuel into the system, I know I'll quickly be to that like survival needs met. And then I can really start to uh, explode things, I think. So I know that's true. But on a day to day basis, I feel the pain, you know, quite often. Mm. Um. So I, I updated you on my Upwork stats, although I don't have them in front of me, unfortunately. Um, but I can say I got one new client and uh, experientially, what, basically what you said, something I think of still often is you need to get a lot of shitty leads, basically, or just a lot of leads and it doesn't matter if they're shitty. And so I did ramp up my outreach during that following couple of weeks before I took my vacation. Um, and once again, I, it can confirmed that if you do more outreach, you will get clients, you know, like it's, I feel like I lose faith in that every time, but I did get a new client. Um, and it, we established that each client is roughly averages out to be about 200 bucks a month for me on Upwork. So you just, your philosophy was just stack up as many of those as possible and pretty soon you're at your survival and then you can start focusing on these other next level things. And I was like, well, there it is. It, this guy, you know, he can only do one hour a week or whatever, but that's still 200 bucks a month. Cool. And so that, um, yeah, I would like to dig more into that. Okay. I wonder if, do you want to give the baseline update with the podcast stuff from this email first, or do you want to dig into this? Because this is something that I really want to dig into with you today is the Upwork stuff. So would you rather give the podcast check-in stuff? Because I am curious how your interviews yeah. went at the end of the week, or do you want me to dig into this now? Um, yeah, let me just, I'll, I'll finish the email, talk about the podcast stuff as well. And then I think that the theme of this week will be what you want to dig into with, the, with okay. that, those stats. So, um. Uh, one thing that's amazing that I included in the email, and it's all part of this conversation, and it's something that I learned from you, is the time tracking thing. I am tracking my time. Whenever I do work, I track it, which is new for me. It, something I never wanted to do, but entering the freelance world, it seems like it's essential. It's just a skill you have to get familiar with and good at if you want to survive, <laughs> if you want to do well. I think you could survive without it, but to thrive, I think you need it. Yeah. So that's a new habit for me in my life that I can see having a lot of good downstream effects, but definitely for freelancing, it's, it's worth, uh, worth. And you've been tracking um, all of your time, like your prospecting time, your client work time, et cetera. Yeah. Anything freelance related, I've been tracking. Um, I haven't looked at it yet. To be honest, I just 
I've been tracking it though, which is its own thing. It's its own yeah. like little mental. It's a psychological game. milestone. Yeah. Right. Um, so that's interesting. <laughs> um, cool. So yeah, I got one new client. And da, 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 da. I also realized, and this ties into what we'll talk about next with the podcasting, that some of my clients actually are interesting podcast guests. So I asked this person if he wanted to be on my podcast, which I did. I recorded a few days ago, and I can talk more about that. Um, because he's he's doing a course, and my prescription to him as a marketing consultant was that I think he should try to get on podcasts. And I was like, well, I'm doing, I'm building this outreach system hmm. for myself. I can do that for you. And he said, yeah, that sounds great. So there's some synergy in all of this. Um, yeah. One person said I was overqualified, which I think just means I was too expensive for what he was hoping for from Upwork because what hmm. overqualified. Yeah. Um, another person, she really liked me. Oh, this is relevant too, be, to our last conversation because you told me, see, I was thinking all the advice I've heard on online for Upwork was like, you got to charge more, charge more. And so I was thinking, okay, as soon as possible, I need to get, go from charging $50 an hour to $100 an hour. And you completely reframed that. And you said, that's if for what you think I'm looking to do and what you can help me with. Mm -hmm. Upwork is serving a very specific function. And for that, we need as much to be flowing through that as possible to me, you know, reduce the friction. So keep it at $50 an hour and just get more. And yeah. I thought that was really interesting. That was like counterintuitive to what I thought somebody in your position would say. And I think you're right. And, and for a lot of reasons, because I think that's one client, she really liked me, but I was at that point, I was, I, I had raised my rates to a hundred dollars an hour and she was considering it at that rate. But I think in the end, she just found somebody cheaper. And I think that's going to happen a lot on Upwork. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I okay. I think the way I put it last time is I'd rather see you get full at 50 and then raise to 100 versus raise to 100 and then potentially have to backtrack because you're not getting the lead flow. Yeah. Yes. And that, and yeah, again, that was like counterintuitive, which is like, uh, that that sounds interesting because I wouldn't have expected that. So I, I think you were right there. Um, so just the podcasting, I, I, this is one of the reasons that I signed up for this community not knowing what it was um, just from a good recommendation from a credible friend. And I thought maybe I would just kind of be like watching freelancers from a distance, see what they do and learn how to mimic the behavior. That's, that's what I thought I was going to do. Um, but then you started talking to me and you gave me access to the blueprint stuff. And I went through, well, I heard you guys talking about this Trojan horse thing and I was like, and then I looked and I found out what the Trojan horse podcast was. And I don't know, just, it just like all these things started clicking into place for me that this podcasting mechanism, I saw how it fit in with what I want to do with freelancing, what I want to do in creating like a creator business, doing courses mm -hmm. and all this. It just cl clicked for all these things. So I've been going hard on that. Um, so it is working extraordinarily well, not necessarily, well, I'm not following your advice. So I want to disclaim that because the Trojan horse podcast is very, something very specific and is designed to get you clients. I took that and like moved a little bit. So I'm not surprised that it hasn't turned into new clients yet for me because I'm not doing exactly what you recommended. However, it's leading to a lot of cool things and it's working really well, um, as a, as a method, um, I'm finding it very easy to get guests for podcasts. I think it's like the easiest thing ever. <laughs> People just say yes to podcasts. I don't know. Um, it's forced me to deal with a lot of things like logistical issues, like finding co-working spaces because I want to travel while I'm doing this. Um, this week or last week, I had a day where I accidentally scheduled four podcasts. I did them all. I told you about that, but I'm also integrating this into my client work. Uh, one of my clients, I think the best way for me to extract content from him so that I can then go produce it and publish it for SEO and for social media is he doesn't have time to create content. He's not going to, I told him to sit down and record videos. There's no way he's going to do it. So I said, let me sit down with you 
let's just talk for two hours. And I know because I did a podcast with somebody and that one hour turned into 30 clips for social media plus a full podcast with my editing. I know that if I sit down with a client, I can do the same thing, except this one, I'm going to add a layer of SEO research on top and my experience from direct response marketing to try to get those keywords that will turn into leads and sales. But it's the same mechanism. It's podcasting. So I sat down with him. We did it. I'm so excited because I think it worked really well. And as we're recording, I'm like making clips in my head. And I'm like, not only are we creating solid pieces of content for every single SEO term that I wanted, we sat down for two hours. We got like, I think maybe 15 full SEO videos that will stand on their own as evergreen content. Plus I'm earmarked a bunch of clips. And now, plus I gave myself maybe 10 hours of work. You know, I knew from that two hours of his time, that was going to give me 10 hours of client work plus good stuff for his business, evergreen content plus social uh, short content that's going to grow his business. So that was essentially a podcast. Um, I did start a case study with a friend from Twitter because I'm because of, you know, what I'm looking to do here. I'm like, I've never done a case study. So I just asked him, hey, uh, he's got a brand new business. He's starting by himself. He's got a shoestring budget. And I said, can I just record? He doesn't know anything about marketing. <laughs> He's really good at a bunch of other things, but he doesn't know anything about marketing. So I said, can we record a case study? And kind of like you, six months, I thought that's a good time frame to, you know, just with consulting input, have a good impact. So I said, how about we record it over the next six months? That's an hour a month of commitment for me. And I just want to see, can I get more customers to his business? Hmm. So I started that. Did the first episode. Um, I am also using podcasting as a networking tool, which I think is a power lever built into the Trojan horse thing. Is it gives you an excuse to reach out and connect with people in whatever space. Um, I am connecting with peers, which I really, I again, I want your advice on this in this call. How do I change? You know, where should how should I change that to people who are more likely to be clients? So far, the people that I've had as podcast guests, I mentioned my service to them and they're like, ah, yeah, I'm not really working on YouTube right now, but I'll keep that in mind. So I've got like 80% of it right. But if I were to do the same thing to a certain group of people, I'm sure that it would be like, really? You do that? That's amazing. Um, yeah. But the mechanism itself is working amazing. And it's also tying into my client work now. It's become a mechanism, I think, that I can do for clients uh, consistently. Let's see. Yeah, my first piece of content I mentioned here, my first podcast I did with a, a another freelancer, actually. I Oh, two of my guests have been freelancing experts. One is uh, Dominic Kent. He wrote a book called The Autonomous Freelancer that I really liked. Another is a guy named Andy Strote. He wrote a book called How to Start a, Cre- a Successful Creative Agency. Both are very successful freelancers. So I'm also getting to learn, you know, from Dominic, I learned like how to communicate uh, autonomous boundaries with clients, which I immediately put into practice. It was great. And how to think about that. Uh, He also has some really cool things about lifestyle and stuff. Andy is like a seasoned vet. He's basically retired from having built a very successful advertising agency and ran it for like 30 years. So it was like this, I got all this wisdom and he And he also said like, hey, if you ever need any advice, let me know. So it's really cool. And and I love it. I just love it. So, um, But my first podcast with Dominic has so far, I've cut it up when I have time. I take out another little short clip. The one hour podcast has turned into 30 clips. I've published 11 of them. And so far, it's gotten more than 10,000 views across multiple platforms, Twitter, Facebook, fan page, YouTube, Pinterest. It's gotten me on my channel, 12 subs on YouTube. Uh, Every time I tweet and uh, tag Dominic, he retweets it to his audience and he has like 8,000 people. So each of those gets seen a few hundred times. Andy's probably going to do the same. Every guest is going to retweet to their audience, which is really cool. Um, One of my Twitter friends, I'm going to be doing a podcast with him this, this week or next week. Um, and I did, I, I packaged up a version of this service I think I could provide to people, which is 
I sit down with you for two hours and then you're done and I turn it into a bunch of content and I just threw it at him for 500 bucks a month and he said, oh, that's really good price. Like, that's interesting. So I'd like your help maybe workshopping that as well, that offer. Uh, yeah, and I got career advice from two really successful freelancers. Da, da, da. So I think I'm both crafting my new offer. This is what I said in the email. I think my offer is going to be something in this realm. Uh, also, I'm building kind of the next phase of my creator business. Plus, I'm hopefully close to getting the client thing flowing from it as well. But the mechanism is down. I figured out scheduling for the most part, except for my travels kind of make it harder, but I'm, I'm working on it and I've done a really good job so far. I'm figuring out uh, tracking my time. I'm figuring out it's forcing me to become a better editor. I just looked at my old like TikToks from a couple months ago and I am like 10 times better as an editor. And my views nice. are getting better and better because my editing is so much better now. And so, and I've got a lot of content flowing through my, my pipes. So I'm just like learning how to systemize all of that, which I can then bring to clients if I know how to find them. Cool. Yeah. I'm seeing a lot of really good bones. And I think what, what sticks out to me is that we just need to like focus you in a little bit. I don't know if that resonates with you. Uh, totally. I see that too. A lot of good bones. Uh, it's just un unfocused or kind of maybe focused a little yeah. bit at the wrong direction. So I think that's, that's it. I think I, yeah. I think that's how it goes. Like I've been reflecting on how it almost feels like my role as a coach. It's like if you're flying a plane and you get one degree off course, you know, it doesn't make a difference for a while, but the longer you stay at one degree off course, the further off course you get. But the, the reality of flying a plane is that you make micro course corrections. The pilot doesn't just point it the right way and then fuck off and you know, have a coffee. They like sit there and make the little course correct or the autopilot mm -hmm. does. And that's kind of, I think what my goal or my role is here, you know, like it's been a few weeks, it's enough time for you to kind of deviate a little. And, and I think my role is just to kind of, you know, point it a little bit straight again. So to me, the big wins that I'm seeing are these, this traction with the podcast, even if it's maybe traction in a non strategically helpful for your freelancing business direction, it's still building skills. Like you're building podcast production skills, you're building outreach skills. So these skills all help you. Um, the thing that I remember from an earlier chat was I was saying to you, Brad, how can we perhaps convert some of your existing YouTube followers into clients? What content could you put out on your YouTube that would essentially be like how to do video marketing as an affiliate marketer? And by the way, you can hire me to do this. And I don't think I see any of that being released on your Nomad Brad. I'm seeing more of these like, you know, how to become an autonomous freelancer and these things that you've been doing lately. Have you put out any content on your YouTube to try to convert your affiliate marketing audience into clients? No, I haven't really had any like mental like developments on that. Like I can't really see how to position it to the audience that I have. I'm sure it's there. I think it's probably this like uh, content multiplication angle. Like it's been around forever, but I know that affiliates, I, I think would pay attention to that. This like the system. You know, I think they'd be interested in the system. So if I can make a video outlining the system, and I was I was thinking about that last night. Um, yeah, that would be. Okay. I think that would be it. It's just like how to turn. But the thing is, a, a lot of affiliates, at least my kind of affiliates, they want to do like faceless is the word that they like. Mm. Um, faceless automation. So they need it to be uh, like all like. So then I'm like, well, how do you create the content? Yeah. And They're maybe it wouldn't be down. viable. Yeah. 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 I think, I think about it a lot, but I haven't had any breakthroughs on it. Okay. So what I'm going to do, since it took a while to give the recap and the timer now says two minutes, I'm going to just <laughs> okay. set this to be longer. So we have more time for actual coaching. So sorry to everyone for the loud beeps. So we'll call it, let me see. I have a call coming up in a little bit. We'll call it 12 minutes from here. So we have to make the most of it. Uh, so my thought is that what's going well is this skill building. What's not going well is the like the getting clients part. 
And all of the stuff that you're doing for like investing into your content processes, like your content production processes and all these things, these are like, I think of them as long-term investments where you like put money in this slot machine and then it like takes like six months to process it in its little back end and then mm. it spits out some exponential return. But what you need is the like short-term linear return where you don't get the huge yeah. payoff, but you get it quickly. So number one, indeed, the core premise of the Trojan Horse interview as we teach in the blueprint is that the people you're interviewing should be your ideal clients and that the role of that interview, it is partly to get clients, but the bigger role is that it helps you validate your service offering to see if what you're offering is something people care about. And if you're only talking to peers who are not really your target clients, you're not going to get any good data on that and you're not going to probably get clients. So that would be one pivot to make is to start asking yourself, who is your ideal client? Is it a course creator? Is it a small business who wants to be doing video? Because you've done stuff for small business before. And try to be getting your podcast interviews with them because they're the ones who you're going to get the good data from. But this is, again, this is like a long-term payoff thing. The, the short-term payoff, and this is where if you can pull up Toggle, I'd like to see your reports. Like To me, the fact that I'm hearing you saying you made this Upwork prospecting a big priority for two weeks and that you were only able to get one client from it, that's either reflecting that you didn't put in enough time, in which case it's not a red flag, it's just something that needs to be tweaked, or you did put in enough time and you didn't get a very good result, which is a red flag, because that means that there's a very low limit. Like, let's pretend you made YouTube marketing, or sorry, you made your Upwork marketing strategy your top priority for two weeks and you're only able to get one client. That means you can only reliably get two clients a month, which would be a problem because that's not a lot of clients. Uh, but last time we were talking, it sounded like I'd have to pull up my numbers, but I want to say it sounded like five hours should have yielded two clients. I'll have to find my data. But yeah, I guess that's yeah, my that question. Is, right. My question is how many hours did you invest into it and what representation of what you could have invested was it? Like, did you hit your ceiling or did you? could you have done more? I definitely could have done more and I have a development on that um that i'll mention briefly i interviewed or i didn't interview i was just chatting with one of my twitter friends and he said he got his start on upwork he's now a six-figure uh, freelancer about with google ads but he started on upwork and he gave me some good advice and it's kind of like mixed with your advice which is get as many leads as possible he said he would do five to ten outreaches per day um and what he did is like i started really broad and then i niched down into youtube and what he recommended is like niche back out a little bit. And he said, you know, yeah, I was focused on Google ads. My profile was focused on Google ads, but I would do like, I would set up websites for people. I would make YouTube thumbnails. Like I would read scripts, like whatever. And that kind of like opened up a thing. And this was just a couple of days ago. I was like, oh yeah, it's Zach's advice. But, but the, we had a limitation on your version because I, I told you there was a limitation of how many YouTube jobs there were per week that's still true. And, you know, so I can kind of tap that out, but if I expand it a little bit, but I keep, I keep my scent, my focus on YouTube, I don't have to change my profile or anything or my positioning, but just start throwing out more things and just start getting those little like $20, $100, $200, whatever, those little gigs. I think, I think there could be some more daylight there and that would open me up to be able to do five to 10 a day. So I do have my toggle tracking. Again, I haven't looked at reporting. I'm a little overwhelmed by it. If you want to look at it together. Yeah, so what I would do, let's let's go, I'll pull up my toggle for my own projects and we can look together or you could share your screen if you want. Uh, yeah, I can yeah, maybe you share your screen. That'd be the easier way to go. But what I really want to see is like how many time how many hours did you spend on this? And what I'm curious yeah. for you is how many more hours you could have spent because your friend's advice while while viable like if you're not hitting the cap on this yet um, might not be time to, let's just see. So if you filter, so go up to the top. Okay. Uh, or actually, I guess it's, so first off, go to reports on the left-hand side. You're under projects right now. Reports. And then go to set it for July 5th until now. So just click that, yeah. And then click July 5th and then click the 31st and then just click out. And then, uh, from here, these are all your different projects. So you could filter this down by product. I don't know how you've organized it. So um, so I see Upwork client. Uh, 
discovery call, Upwork client, and then different people's names. So which where are you tracking your prospecting? Oh, outreach uh, searching. Okay. Searching is one. Okay. So it looks like I spent two and a half hours on searching. And then three and a half um, on Loom videos, looks like. Yes. Yep. Okay. And this has yielded one booked client and how many leads that you think might close? What's been the result of this? I had two conversations. Uh, one closed. The others, I don't think. I don't think anything's happening. So, okay. So this puts us at <clears throat> about six hours for one client, and it is it's tough because if it's six hours to get get something that's small, it's like one hour a week. Like it's it's gonna be hard to get an ROI on that because two hundred two hundred dollars a month from one client, if it's separated like that, you have the cost of like task switching and stuff. So, but let's just do the math. So I'm just gonna write it down. And what representation of like your max is this? Like if you wanted to have done it for more, how much more could you have done it for? Well, I am also trying to get my client work up, right? So yeah, I could probably at the max if I real if I really I could probably double the time, I would guess. Of outreach. I don't want to, but I probably could. And this represents how much of a period like because I know you you were out for vacation and stuff. Is this like a one week right. period where you did it? You can kind of see my my vacation is the fifteenth through the twenty fifth. So um I guess can you, this uh, is up at the top where it says filters, can you click the project one and then just select only the the two upwork the research and the loom videos ones? I want to see where the time goes. Outreach searching. And then click out. Okay, so yeah, so indeed this spans from essentially the 5th to the 14th. So it's about a one week period. So you could have been you could have done twice as much and this was 3 weeks. So if you had done this for 12 hours a week, you could have booked 6 clients basically. Which would have been 1200 bucks a month. So so you're saying your cap on what you let me just make sure I've got the numbers right. Take 6 hours to get one client. We've confirmed this. And it backs up anecdotal. Obviously, there's not loads of data, but nonetheless, we could just say six. And you said you could do twice as much. So this means you could spend twelve hours a week doing this, even though you don't want to. You could. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the way that this would break down in terms of numbers, I'm curious with your research. Uh, so that like Upwork outreach searching one, is this something you could easily delegate to somebody not very expensive? And also with this three and a half videos, for, three and a half hours for Loom videos, like it sounds like a really long time. Do you know how that time broke down? Are there inefficiencies there? Are there things you could offload? Like where did those three and a half hours go? Or maybe a better question is, how many replies does this represent? Mm. I think I had like five replies, maybe two books, one close. So three and a half hours is you sending five Loom videos? Oh, or... um, oh, I see. Um, no, I probably sent more like 10 or 15. I wish I would have gotten the data. I'm sorry. Um, oh, no worries. This is exactly I mean, the process, though. Like the way I yeah. do my time tracking process is I track it. And if I'm reviewing it and I wish I had more data, I make a note to be more granular moving forward. And then if I am too granular and I'm like, I don't need all this stupid data, then I can be more broad. So from here, maybe you'll just make a note. Like maybe each time you do a video, you could have the time entry, say like the person's name, or you could just like make a little tally. But I'm just basically what I'm over here wondering is how much of this three and a half hours for your Loom video outreach is you doing research, like reading the post, reading the job post, calling out the mm. things you want to do, and how much of it is you talking into Loom? That's what I'm wondering about. Yeah, the talking into Loom is usually small. It is the research. It's me looking at their website or their YouTube channel or whatever. So it probably takes, yeah, I would guess like 10 or 15 minutes at least per 
uh, informed call. I also, during this time, I experimented with a new thing that I thought would work really well, which was making custom thumbnails for my Loom outreach and also having more of a funny uh, approach. And that bombed. So Mm. I'm not going to be funny uh, at all. Like I thought it would be like, oh, cool. He's like interesting. And Mm. I made these like really cool thumbnails that stood out. I, I even put one person's face on the thumbnail and he was the one who was like you're overqualified I'm like mm. whoa so the tone of upwork is definitely not at least for me not funny you got to be professional so mm. they just there's no I, I thought that would be like a unique angle but no yeah i mean it, it might be too early to draw a conclusion response. that it was that mm. specifically but yeah. in terms of 80 20 like layering on more time commitment that might not be moving the needle. I think that's worth taking a takeaway. I've seen one that I got a cold outreach loom video style for that I thought was quite cool. His loom thumbnail, it was still generic because I don't think it said my name. I'd have to go try to find it. I don't think it said like Zach, check this out. I think it had like him holding like a piece of paper that said like, I made this video and he's like pointing and smiling or something. Mm -hmm. I think that that worked kind of well, but but yeah, so maybe when you're tracking your time this next week, if you could break out another project, so you have your Upwork Loom Videos outreach, maybe you make like Upwork Loom Videos research and then Upwork Loom Videos recording, because I'd be really interested to see how it breaks down. The reason I'm asking for this data is that we are trying to determine your cost per client. And if this searching takes two and a half hours for one client, and then the Loom video creation process relies on two and a half hours of research. That means there's like five hours of stuff. Oh, all right. This, we got to go longer though, because we're not done yet. Um, that means there are like five hours of things that need to happen for you to create those videos. And what if somebody could do that work at a lower rate? It would mean that you could do more of this outreach and you could still be booking clients on a month one profit, but it wouldn't be short term month one profit because you don't right now have the budget, frankly, to do this. Um, but but moving forward, you very well could. So for now, what I'd be interested to see is like, I know you don't want to do this outreach, but given that you have the capacity, if we're looking at this, like if you invest, if, if all our numbers are accurate, it means that if you invest 12 hours a week, you should be able to get eight clients a month, which is $1,600 of monthly recurring revenue, which seems like for where you're at financially, it could make all the difference for your your comfort and stuff. So yeah. I'm curious, like even though it sounds boring and you've got ADHD and boring repetitive shit is so hard to get people with ADHD to do, especially unmedicated people with ADHD. And I get that. If I wasn't medicated, I would have a very hard time doing this. But would you be willing for one month to do it as an experiment? Say, I am going to do this process for 12 hours a week or it does not feel worth it to you? Yes, it does feel worth it because not only all the things that you mentioned, but I know that there are uh, there are uh, serendipitous and exponential things on the other side of doing something like that. Like I, like my friend, I know that the higher you climb up on Upwork, you start to get into tiers where people will reach out to you, and they don't mm-hmm. even bother with putting out jobs. They just reach out to people that have enough qualification. I know, like for example, I'm at six k. I know that once you get to ten k, you meet a lot of people's bare minimum standards. Mm. So, yes, I'm willing to do that. It does sound boring, but I'm I'm willing to do it. Okay. Then, in terms of like the schedule impact of this, if I were to say, okay, so each of the so so let's let's carry this out, right? So let's say that you were doing this for twelve hours a week. That's two clients booked a week, which represents um, <clears throat> eight hours booked a month for from these two clients. If it's an average client. So that means your time in the business work so far for lead generation and project fulfillment is 20 hours a week. So you have a bunch of other time to play with. Um, And then you've got existing clients who you're serving. So that's going to be easily another 10. And then you're doing these side projects. So that, that would be kind of what I'm getting at here is like, what if you allocated, I don't know how many hours a week you're trying to work these days. I'm assuming 40, but I know that that's just a generic assumption. So that's actually, I guess, the first question is, what? It, how many hours a week are you working right now, roughly? Um, my rough budget is six hours a day, so that would be 30 okay. hours. Okay. So 
30 hours a week, 20 of it will go to this experiment and the fulfillment of the experiment. And then what do you reckon your your current client project fulfillment work is per week for like your past clients who you're continuing to work with? Yeah, it is about 10 hours actually. Okay. So that pretty much caps you out. So yeah. your your only options then if you want to do the Trojan horse interviews right now, which you're having fun with and it will benefit you, is to either work more hours, delegate some of your lead generation work, or like cut some scope somewhere. So this only scope you could cut would either be like frankly, the biggest scope you would cut would be the lead gen time. But the lead gen time being cut means you'll get less immediate projects, which means you have less money, which means you have less confidence and all of these things. So that's the tricky bit. Definitely you wouldn't want to cut your client fulfillment work that you already get because you need all the client fulfillment work you can get. So if you had to choose, so so let's go back to that delegating thing. I don't think it makes sense for you right now to delegate the researching part. But just as an example, if you did, if you had somebody at $20 an hour handling five hours of like prep work for a potential client, then that means you spend $100 to get this client. Um, but it also means that they're not going to be putting as much money in your pocket the first month, which delays your financial viability. So when you're looking at your when you're looking at your time this way, are you more inclined to work more hours, like say work on Saturdays, or try to cut some scope somewhere like kind of like tabling your Trojan Horse podcast for a month? Yeah, I guess that's a question. Which of those two do you like the idea of better? Working longer days slash working weekends or cutting your podcast scope for a bit or cutting your lead gen on Upwork? Those are kind of your options. Mm. Uh, work more hours, I think, is the easiest one for me. I don't mind working nights and weekends. I do have personal sort of obligations that tend to change that sometimes but um but yeah i don't feel like i'm ready for the delegate either and i kind of have cut the scope on trojan horse like i made a couple commitments that i'm going to fulfill but after that I've, i kind of paused my getting of new guests because i realized that this is a a spigot that i can turn on and, and like if i actually have the mental capacity to do it it's going to grow really fast and I don't, and it's always going to be there, I think. So, um, yeah, I kind of have cut the scope on that. Okay. Then as we're talking about next steps, like the, the pivots I would like to see, I think, between now and the next couple of weeks, but we'll probably connect next week anyway. In terms of me steering this thing or like writing the course correction, whatever you'd call it, the thing that I think would be the biggest impact for you would be number one, let's just have you do this experiment of 12 hours a week for lead gen on Upwork just to solidify our numbers and see if the assumptions we're making six hours for one client, 200 bucks a month, like just find out what our baseline even is. That's a really high priority. If, it were, if I were in your shoes, I'd want to find that out ASAP. I would also be wanting to validate my service offering. This idea you're putting together, like I, I really love your uh, idea of sitting down and doing the video recording. I think that's super valuable. Um, and as I told you before the interview, like I'm slightly stealing your idea. I think it's so smart. And so that would be my kind of priority too, is starting to have some conversations with people who would be your target customers. And then remember, there are opportunities on your plate that you're not capitalizing on already. Like uh, I want to book you personally, Zach, for some paid research and strategic work. And I haven't heard from you on that. So that's like an easy money thing. And I would imagine that those two connections that you have um, who are like friends who you've worked with before would be good opportunities for you to do. Like, So to me, that I think that the value, the reason why the idea I'm stealing from you, I'm implementing slightly differently. Like, I think that even for people who aren't hard into video, they usually have some belief of what their content obligations are. Like, And for me, my belief is that it's really important to send out a newsletter every week to our email list. And so if I were being pitched your thing about videos and shorts and social media, that would flag overwhelm because I'm like, well, shit, I can't even handle my tiny content obligations. How am I supposed to do all this social media stuff? I just need to get this stuff sorted first before I can even think about all that. Mm -hmm. But the thing about video as a vehicle for that is like assuming you can find a writer who can mimic the brand voice and do a good enough job writing, 
being able to take take all that time off of a client's plate so that they no longer have to spend 12 hours a month writing their newsletters and now it's just all off their plate except for a two-hour call, that seems like a much easier sell than saying you're going to get all these videos and stuff. Yeah. But as you're solidifying your service offering, I don't know if you feel like you're ready to pitch it to the friends yet or whatever. So I guess scaling all this back, if you feel aligned with it, I think that the week, the week one goal is spend 12 hours doing lead gen and op work, see what you can get from it, see if, it, if the assumptions are correct. And then 10 hours will go to existing client work. And so that alone puts you at 30. And so you can then decide, do I want to stop here? Do I want to do some more proper Trojan horse things to start solidifying my service offering? I think that it's a good idea. Like I, I, I noted it as like a gem win kind of thing that you might help clients do a cold outreach, podcast outreach strategy. Like that's cool. That's a cool service offering. Um, being able to say, hey, you want to start guest podcasting? Like how about instead of going and figuring it out yourself, you just work with me and I get you booked. That's super valuable. Uh, so yeah. So I'd say that you have your 30 allocate hours al allocated there. And then for anything else, you can either sip margaritas on the beach, although I suspect you're not really by a beach to do that on. But nonetheless, you can sip margaritas on your couch with no shirt on. Um, or you can, you know, you can work on other things or do the Trojan horse or whatever you want. Like, how do you feel about that 30 hour obligation? Uh, sounds fine from this point position, but I know I'm already thinking of after we hang up, I have to start on outreach and I'm like, Oh God. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, so that's, yeah, that's, I guess we don't have a lot of time to dig into it because I have yep. this call coming up, but, um, yeah, like for me, the, the thing that I really do kind of rely on my ADHD meds for is if I have boring, repetitive work that I don't want to do. Like the other day, I was really, really struggling to do some DYF stuff. And I was like, why? And I started journaling and I was like going to unpack it. And I was like, what am I so afraid of? And that's like, oh, wait, I don't think I took my ADD meds today. And I checked <laughs> and I did it. And it was the first day in like months that I hadn't taken them. I was like, oh my God, this is what my life was like before. And I just forgot because it's been so long. So, um, what are there any structures that you can reliably use to do the boring repetitive work that, that actually works to get yourself to do it? Should I nag you more about exploring getting medicated? Like what do you need to do to be able to do the boring repetitive stuff? Mm, committing to you, that's pretty big for me. Okay. Mm, so that that's good. Um you know, honestly, the brain FM thing has had an impact okay uh, i've been using that as a system and if i just like turn it on usually within like five or ten minutes i'm like ready to go it's not a, it's not a miracle cure obviously but like it does help for sure have you tried focus mate before focus mate yeah no. so here's a stack that you could do that my girlfriend's doing right now so there's a tool called focus mate which is focusmate.com you can book live co-working sessions with people there's another tool called Beeminder, like be like the bug, beeminder.com, that is a way for you to implement punishments for yourself if you don't do what you say you're going to do. And so uh -huh. you can actually integrate Focusmate with Beeminder, where like if you don't do enough Focusmate sessions or if you cancel your sessions, you have to like pay them a fine. Uh, so if it, if it were me doing this and I knew that these 12 hours of Upwork were going to be really difficult, what I would do is I would reverse engineer how many Focusmate sessions do I need to book. So each focus mate session is 50 minutes. So 12 times 60 is 720 minutes divided by 50. So that's 14.4 focus mate sessions. So I would probably do is I would go on, I would sign up for focus mate. I'd put 14 focus mate sessions on my calendar and I would not let myself cancel them. And on every focus mate session, I would start this could basically the way focus mate works is you start the session and you tell each other what you're working on. And then you sit there with your video on and you just work silently. Uh, so I would just say like, I'm doing my Upwork and I just want to be focused the whole time. And I, if I were at risk of canceling these and bailing on them, I would set up Beeminder to really force me to do it. Um, how, does, how does that sound? Ugh. It sounds <laughs> <laughs> Uh Yeah, I'll, I'll, 
consider that one. That's that does sound like what somebody would do if they were really serious about getting results, though. It does, sure doesn't does. it? Sure does sound <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah, well, because that is the thing. Like, if you need to spend these twelve hours, and that's non negotiable, then how do we get you to spend them? That's kind of the question. Yeah. Or or do we need to scale back and say, Zach, I don't actually want to do this, and we need to find something else that works. You know, I think another thing that immediately feels useful to me is just saying, I know you said three weeks, but I'm just going to say one week. Like, let's do, okay. I want to do it one for week one experiment. week at 12 yeah. hours. And if I see, see a needle move, that could be encouraging. And I can report that to you. If I don't, yeah. then yeah, maybe I have to try something else. Okay. Then yeah, one week experiment, no big commitment. You just have to do it this week. We'll connect next week and we'll see what these 12 hours results are in. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Well, then, anything else before we wrap? Uh, just an hour long conversation about that service offering, but we'll do that <laughs> next time. Okay. I think Sounds I'm good. signed up to join. Do you think it's okay? Here's a, a quick question. Do you think it's worth it for me to keep coming to like accelerator sessions and stuff? I want to. You can keep coming to your accelerator sessions, but for office hours, I'd probably prefer to keep those here because for people on who are like following your journey, I think it'd be useful for them to be seeing what you're doing. Um, so if you want to come to office hours in addition to these, I mean, well, because that's the thing. Do you really need more than one coaching session a week? I think accelerator sessions in addition to these, cool. But would you ever need to do an office hours and one of these? No, I guess not. No. Okay. Then yeah, let me know if if we need to modulate things. So if you're feeling differently, if you're like, oh, I really wish there was more coaching time, we can talk about that. But but yeah, for now, I would say totally you can come to accelerator sessions, accelerator sessions if you want, since those have a different role. Uh, but probably these would sort you out from the office hours perspective. Yeah, those are, those are all just things that I I'm using to make kind of keep myself stuck in the world of freelancing because yeah, that part of me wants to run entirely you know from the whole thing so. And maybe finding of, an accountability like, partner within the community would be smart too. I used to have uh, Kate from Entrepreneur on Fire. They were a client of mine. I would check in with Kate. Her and I would chat on Skype back in the day. Uh, we would chat on Skype every morning. Uh, and we would like literally tell each other what we were working on and connect on goals and stuff. So that might be something good for you too, is finding an accountability I, I had buddy. that with Farron when I was I was mm. staying with him in Colombia. And that, that he might he would be willing to do that, I think, maybe. Nice. Yeah. And you could put a, a feeler out in the general channel. I bet that you'd be able to find people. I bet Marius would be keen, maybe. Um, so Brad and I were talking. And then what we did is we headed off and we went on Zoom and did the accelerator session. But he wants to connect on a couple things. And we have some time because he's the only one there today, which isn't, I guess, very good social proof. So maybe I should say there were thousands of people there and we just did this anyway. But nonetheless, uh, he was the only one there today. So we're going to do just a few minutes here. But then we realized that I misremembered the session. I thought it was 30 minutes earlier than it was. So the session actually starts in eight minutes. So we're going to just try to get Brad sorted here with coaching in the next eight minutes. And then we're going to splice this in before the outro to the episode. So Brad, you said you wanted to get my take on something about your service offering. And then something else came up when you're doing your goal setting in the accelerator session. Or what do you want to, what do you want to use the next time? Okay. For? The thing on the accelerator session, as I remembered yesterday, I, I've wanted to find a way to have daily emails for a long time, for like years. And I think my process is reversed for most people. Most people say you need to write things out. You need to think about things, write things out, then record. It doesn't work for me. I have to do the opposite. I have to start by recording. And in recording, I will think through things. And mm -hmm. then once I have a recording, especially with Descript, I can transcribe and then I have writing. So that's a big unlock. In two hours, I interviewed myself. Essentially, I gave myself prompts and I was able to record five separate videos that uh, are now going to be daily emails for this week. So I'm going to have daily emails for the first time in years because I changed how I structured this. All that is to, in service of this service offering. You said you think that as a person who would maybe be interested in this service, you need it to be like, the only impact it has on you is those two hours. And that's exactly how I want to structure my service offering is all you have to do is sit down with me for, it doesn't even have to be two hours, just one hour. Cause I know a one hour podcast can turn into 30 clips. That's a month's worth of recordings. That's a month's worth of content calendar stuff. So all I want to offer to people, but I don't know how to say it 
in a way that they're interested in is you sit down for me with me for one, two hours, depending on how much you want, and then you're done. I walk away, I do this stuff, and now you have a full month of content or whatever. I don't know what's most appealing. Is it the month of content? My content calendar is filled up. I also have been playing with an idea of multiplying their views, right? Like, so right now I'm thinking I can 10x your views in a month. The, the caveat of that to make it back into the promise is that most people are probably only doing like one or two platforms. If, if I spread it out, I know from experience, if I take a, a, these clips and put them on TikTok, Facebook fan page, Twitter, Pinterest, each one of those usually gets a few hundred views. So like to, to, to 10x somebody's views, all I have to do is 10x the content. If you're putting out one video a month, you need to put 10 plus all the shorts and the shorts get lots of views. So anyways, there's a lot there, but I think there's something really valuable to myself and my clients and I don't know how to say it though. I don't think it's in inherently interesting. I think you have to decide who it's for. And in my own experiment doing a similar thing, like that's kind of what I've been thinking about is like, who who is it for? So depending on who it's for and what they're doing already, that's going to be the hook. Um, if somebody is already doing video, but you notice that they're not very good with social, then your hook could be twofold. One of it what well, like one part of it is i'm going to make it better for you. i'm going to make it easier for you to put out more video that's like the easy hook like to me the way that i'll be selling mine is going to be the time savings so making it less about roi and growing views and more about buying back your time mm -hmm. saying like hey you could do what you're already doing and probably it's also going to be a little bit better except that it's only going to take you 2 hours a month and imagine how much revenue you could be driving if instead of like spending these 30 hours a month on just writing top of funnel content, if you could be spending that on marketing, like how much money could you make and how much more than what I'm charging you to take care of your top of funnel would it be? That's like kind of the sell there. The sell of the like growing leads thing is a lot easier because you say, well, I'm going to do this stuff. It's going to bring you in a bunch more leads, which is going to be more money. So that to me, that's a really easy sell. But the point that I was making to you before that I would make to you again, if you were to try to sell me in DIYF on it is that I don't want a bunch of social media posts written for me that I now have to like go post myself. I, I would want it to be super done for you. And so if your whole sell is like, Zach, I'm going to own all of your social channels and I'm going to track how many leads these things send. And I expect they'll generate XYZ number of leads. And based on your current value per subscriber, that means it should put this many dollars in your pocket. And that's more dollars than I'm charging you. Like to me, it would just be a super easy sell. So I guess that's kind of to answer your question. The way to package it is you look at what this person cares about and you make sure that you frame your, your how in the context of their, what they care about. And that's kind of the point of the Trojan horse interview is you chat with them to learn what their goals are, what their pains are, what they mm. wish they could wave a magic wand and change. And then that informs your service offering without having those conversations. It it's hard to get, guess because that's all you're really doing is guessing. So mm. if you're wanting to hone your service offering, the best way to do it is have conversations with people who are your target audience. So this might include me. This might include your course creator friends. This might include past clients. And this might be Trojan horse people. Um, and like for me, for example, the thing I'm trying to, the thing I need to validate is like, is it viable to train a writer to write in a client's voice for even the most discriminating client palette? Because that's the thing is a lot of people who have a very strong brand voice, their biggest objection is like, sure, that sounds great, but I've tried to hire a writer before and they always suck and they never sound quite like me. So that's the thing I have to validate. It's like, is this even possible? Uh, and if your thing is more on the social, the video, that sort of thing, and it's less about the automating the newsletter, which is like the take I would be taking, then for you, you just ask, what do I have to validate? Do I have to validate, can I actually generate leads from this? Or do you have to validate, is the value of leads coming from social actually going to be high enough to pay off what I need to charge for how much time it's going to take me? Um, things like that. So, but yeah, to, to zoom it all out, like that's a bunch of scaffolding without the data. The first thing to do is like find out what people hate what they wish they could change, what they care about. And then again, there's this thing Brennan says in the blueprint, which is like multiply, not create. 
So probably in general, it's best to look at what people are already doing and saying, how can I make it better or easier? And then do that. So if someone's not doing YouTube yet, saying, hey, I'll make you a bunch of videos, like if they're not already doing video, they're not going to see the value in that. But if they are already doing video and they're not very consistent or um, like you see a lot of opportunities, those to me seem like the best leads because you say, hey, you're doing some stuff already. Your content's good. But I see XYZ specific opportunities. I'm very confident that if I do blah, blah, blah for you, it's going to have this really cool result that you care about. I would love to just do it as a pilot project where if I don't hit blah, blah, blah result, you don't pay me. And if I do, you pay me this. Like something like that, such an easy way to sell it. So easy. Like if you said, Zach, I'm going to own your social media for a month. If I don't generate 100 leads for you, you don't pay for it. Uh, it would be like, it'd be a pretty easy sell. There would be some, there would be some loss aversion considerations though, which is like, there's a risk to starting social media because now I'm kind of like on the hook to run these fucking pages forever. So if it doesn't work out, any of the subscribers that there are, they're expecting stuff. And if I stop posting, they're going to be like, is W freelancing like out of business? So you'll, you'll probably run into that stuff if someone doesn't have social media yet at all. So that's where it might make more sense to say, okay, find the people who are already doing social media, but not doing it very well and just make it better. Um, okay. It's 930. <laughs> does this give you a little bit of insight, help you a little bit? Yes. So Brad, uh, is that clear or is there anything else you want some, you want to dig into? What are you wondering about still? Um, I think you're right. I, I do need to talk to more people and it still just hinges on who do I want to work with? And I don't know. That's the big question. Like, I don't know who I want to work with still. <laughs> I mean, like, you'll, yeah, go ahead. Part of me, if I had, if I picked an ideal person that I would actually like to like hang out with every day, it's the people I'm interviewing on my podcast. It's like creators, which you mentioned as a category, but I also find that they tend to be, at least the people I'm talking to, they tend to be solopreneurs. So they like to do things by themselves. Um, I think like local businesses would probably like my local business client that I have on Upwork, he's just happy to have stuff, you know? Yeah. And, and I also think, you know, I think you're kind of a tough client actually, because you're yeah, asking totally. for like leads. It's like, I don't actually think most people would even, I don't know. You have a lot more experience working with businesses in the client role, but like so far, at least on Upwork, like they're not even thinking that far ahead. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm, I think I'm setting a really high standard trying to meet your standards because I think you have very high standards, which is totally fine. And I came from the direct response world and that's all that's, you know, and I, I found I don't like working for people in direct response because they have such high standards. And then when I, when I started learning about like designers and stuff, I'm like, oh my gosh, like you're not, at, you're not, you're not guaranteeing that you're going to get like 50% ROI and you're still <laughs> charging like $3,000 a month. This is crazy. Cause yeah. in the direct response world, it's like, you must produce 50% ROI. Like they ask for the craziest things. I'm not saying yours are crazy. I think yours are reasonable, but it's definitely oh, it's like making enough. me think and I it's think that a that, very high standard. That's the that's the hook too, is like when you think about small businesses. So Jesse Hanley from Bento, his agency was essentially a copywriter placement agency. And his whole thing, he wasn't like selling on value. He wasn't talking about ROI. He was just like finding, his clients were just people who wanted a writer. They knew they wanted a writer. They just needed a good writer. So he's not over here convincing people they need a writer. He's not over here talking about the ROI of content. He's just saying like, okay, you want a writer? Here's a writer that's good. Goodbye. Pay us every week now. Um, and so similarly, like that's kind of the thing is you've described clients before where they just, they actively want video, but they're not doing a good job now. So they're so easy to sell because all you have to say is like, cool, I'll make you that video you want. Done. Whereas if you're selling it to like a creator, it's a little bit more complex because like they're creating video, they're more DIY, the numbers are different and they are a solopreneur. So this is my question is like, if I'm serving creators, because I don't want to serve dentists, I don't want to fucking talk to dentists all day and have that be my thing. I want to see if I can find a way to do it. And I think about my clients, like I have certain clients who do like $600,000 a year in revenue, $1 million a year in revenue, like basically between like 300K to a million with just them and like one or two VAs. 
And when you are doing that kind of revenue at that kind of scale, like with such a small amount of team resources, you're going to be the bottleneck for so much stuff. And the key thing here for this like hypothetical client who I might serve is that they are doing revenue. They have a business that is built mm -hmm. on content. They're doing a lot of revenue. They're not like just getting started doing 60 grand a year because I'm thinking for the service offering I want to offer, it's probably going to need to cost about $2,000 a month minimum, probably. And if someone's making like 80 grand a year, do you really think they're going to want to trade 50% of their mm -hmm. revenue to get their content made? Mm -hmm. But then on the flip side, like on that interview with Perna and Mayank the other day, Perna was saying that you could go onto, I think it was Crunchbase, and you could see a list of all of the businesses who have recently gotten funding. And that was kind of how it was with Jesse. So he was talking about how he'd work with a lot of startups where it's like content was just a box for them to tick. Like they had yeah. a marketing person who's like, we want to be putting out XYZ articles a week. We just need to tick this box. And so that's kind of the route for you is like, on the one hand, you can either find the people who are kind of plebs who just want to tick the box and they're not very discerning. Uh, and then all you got to do is do tick that box. Or you find the people who are a bit more discerning and they're harder to like, serve in that you have to probably tie things to an ROI and make sure that you can tie it to an ROI. And that my my counter to that is that if I'm going to do this content thing, I don't want it to be tied to the ROI because it would be <laughs> like the kind of stuff I'd have to do. It would just be difficult to do it. So the ROI that I'm tying it to is time. So mm. the hook isn't, I'm going to create newsletters for you that convert better than your current ones because I don't feel confident that I can do that. My hook is I'm going to create newsletters for you that are like basically as good as your current ones so that you don't have to do what you're currently doing so that you can get that time back to generate revenue. Because that's exactly my challenge in DYF is that for me to do all of the like in the business work for DYF that I have to do just to like serve the customers, serve the email list, uh, I am not spending time creating launches. I'm not spending time honing our onboarding flows. I'm not spending time creating new lead magnets. Like there's so much stuff I could be doing that I just am not in favor of just content creation. So for me, all I have to do is get someone to believe that they are spending a certain amount of time that they could buy back. And that's the thing that's still my unknown. Like I know from running DYF, it's a fucking pain to get people to track their time. And I have a client right now who I'm helping her strategically with her launch, but she's doing the writing this time. And like, I'm trying to find out how long did you spend writing this email so I can make projections for how long it'll take you to write the rest of the launch. And it's like hard to even get that information from her. People think it takes them less time than it does when they don't track for, for content creation, I find. Unless they don't like it, in which case they think it takes way more time. That, that's what I've noticed from time tracking myself is if there are tasks I hate, I think they take me 10 hours a week. I look at it and I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, that was only one hour. <laughs> it only took one hour. That's and funny. then the things I love, I'm like, oh no, it takes like five minutes to mm. record some videos. And I look and I'm like, oh, spent six hours. Mm. So um, yeah, all that is to say, I think this you're right to be thinking about this. And I think I am a very difficult client. I don't think I'm a very good client in a lot of ways. I think I'm, I think I'm a good client in that I like to help people grow their businesses. Most clients don't give a fuck. But I'm a hard client in that DYF doesn't do a bunch of revenue. I'm really stingy with where the money goes. I want to make sure I'm putting our limited revenue into like high ROI places. And that's frankly not the best client. Like a better client is someone where it's like, we've got 10,000 bucks a month. We just want to throw it at something. We don't, we don't care. Yeah. It just needs to go somewhere. That, um, that yeah. reminds me of my conversation with Andy Stroh. He said, you should be looking for professional clients instead of amateur clients. And he said, if you find professional clients, real businesses, the first conversation will not be about money. You don't want the first conversation to be about money. Mm. And I'm like, that's that's usually like all the clients I've ever had and all the conversations I've had, it starts out with money. Like what's your mm. rate? How much do you charge for this? But he said, if you find like, he worked with a lot of like government clients and stuff. And he said, you know, the, the public works board or whatever for Ontario still needs a nicely designed brochure. And it still needs to be able to communicate well with their, their customers, so to speak, the public they still need copywriting they still need design and they have like a huge budget and they don't even think about money and same with big corporate things too you know he said at the and i've heard this from my friend brian richards too he works with big corporations as sponsors for his events and he says at december they just start like shelling out money 
and you can just be one of those things that they give money to. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I think it de it does definitely depend on your client. Like, I think if you're working with small businesses, probably the first conversation shouldn't be them. Like, I I I do think, frankly, though, every client reaching out to you, one of the first things I'll ask you is your rates. How much is it going to cost? But so that aside, the whole conversation about money thing, I do think that when I look back at my own consultancy, like most of my clients who I served, I did not do the double your freelancing rate stuff on. I didn't really illustrate how my website was going to make an impact on their business and their bottom line and stuff. It was more commoditized, but it was like very well paid commoditized, but it was essentially just Zach. We want you to build a dope website for us and you built a dope website for this person I trust. So I want you to do it. They didn't even come to me for the strategy. I think that a lot of where I provide value is like helping people decide what actually should go on their website, but they don't value that. No one has ever cared about that. All people care about is a pretty design. Um, and the reason I'm saying all this is like, that is ultimately commoditized work. It's commoditized work that I can bill 175 bucks an hour for, uh, but it is still them saying, I need a keyboard. And I'm saying, sure, I've got a keyboard. Boop, 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 boop. And then we do it. I think that the next level, though, the way to really get to the higher rates, the way to like really secure great long-term relationships is to not stop there. And to to actually talk about what they want this website to do for their business, make sure it's going to do that and make sure that you're like working with them on an ongoing basis to actually serve their real needs. Because there's so many projects that I built them the website and I and that was it. That was the end that I, I missed out on so many opportunities to serve them more and help them grow their businesses. So I know that this is me getting on a little soapbox, but all of this is to say, like, if you're going to go for corporate clients or something, I don't know a lot about servicing corporate clients. But if you're working with small businesses, I do think that you're either going to have two camps of people. One of them is the box to tick person where they say, we want video and we want it to be good. And in those cases, if you're charging more than your competition, they essentially need to either see a higher, higher bar of like quality, a higher bar of service, like they need to see something that as a commodity still differentiates you in order to have you be more expensive. That's the only way to charge more is for them to believe that you're better, faster, more trustworthy, something. There has to be some reason why I should give you more money. Or the way that you charge more is by showing how your service impacts the business in a way that your competitors don't. And to me, that's like the easier way to charge more. Because if you say, all my competitors who are charging blah, blah, blah for video, they are just keyboards you know they're just what what we were just talking about like these are just people who they ask you what videos should i make you send them the stuff they make your videos what i do is i help advise you and i help strategize on how video is going to grow the core goals of your business so i'm not just a video dude video is just a part of how i help on the grand spectrum and my process is to audit your business and learn blah 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 blah, blah and we make this whole strategy and, and video ties into that so like it's just it kind of puts you into a whole different camp uh so all that said, what are your thoughts? What are your questions? What do you disagree with me on? Uh, I like that last part. I think that's uh, the thing I uh, on Upwork, I'm going to try moving out into some adjacent circles for work. And one of the adjacent circles to YouTube is podcasting. A lot of what I'm doing now is kind of around podcasting. And I found there's a lot of work on Upwork for podcasts. And I think I can come in to all those podcast people more, probably even more so than the YouTube people and say, hey, yeah, I'm going to help you get, I'm going to help you tick the box. You're going to get your episode published or whatever. But I'm also a marketer. That's actually what I do like full time. So I want to also talk to you about like, how do you grow this podcast? And I have a strategy where, you know, we make clips and I distribute the clips to all your social media, something like that. Like, let me, let me tick the box of the commodity thing, you know? get a hundred bucks or whatever. But also I happen to be a marketing strategist and I want to help you actually get a result here instead of that. So I, I really like that. What you said there of like, th there is extra value I can provide. However, when I move into the creator or like the marketing world, it's like, I'm just competing with other marketers. Everybody's saying I can get you more leads. I can get you more leads, whatever. And yeah. it becomes harder and harder to deliver on that. But if I move into another zone, mm -hmm. And uh, I love, I love this podcast idea, by the way. And I have an idea for you if you're interested. 
Okay. So yeah. the idea is this. So I did that interview with the Maliks last week, and I was thinking about repurposing content. Because again, that client of mine with the just one executive assistant who does a bunch of business, her business is afford anything. She has like crazy huge downloads, really big podcast, industry leader, and like very basic ass content calendar. Like she pretty much just does the podcast. As of like last week, her podcast editor started chopping up her podcast into videos, but didn't before then. So something I did last week to kind of play with it is I, in Fathom, when I'm doing a podcast, I will do all my highlights of potential gems, but then they usually just, nothing happens with them. I was think, I was doing research recently on YouTube Shorts and thinking about what you said of how you can just cold open, shoot right into it, you don't need to do an intro. But for the podcast ones, I kind of felt like I did for some of them because like to do a video that's just totally cold with some of these things and no context would be weird because people don't know who this guest is so if they just like are on our channel and see some random person talking, I don't know, maybe you can fact check me and tell me I'm wrong, but I just think it's a little bit weird. But anyway, that aside, what I am getting at here is um, after I was off that episode, I basically combed through my Fathom highlights, decided which ones I thought made strategic sense to turn into top of funnel videos, and then just spent 30 minutes and I just shot like 13 intros and I workshopped my Fathom highlight to be a straight up YouTube title or subject line or whatever. And I think that would be a really great differentiator for you on Upwork is if you're pitching someone on podcast production, they care about content delivery and they're already doing an audio. If they're doing audio visual, we don't know, but they're at least doing an audio medium. And so for you to say, yes, I will tick that box. I will produce your podcast, but here's what makes me special. I am a marketer and I'm a professional content marketer, and I've grown my own YouTube channel to this, and I run a podcast. And so what I'm going to do is I, while I'm editing, I'm going to review your video, and I'm going to call out all the best gems. And then I'm going to take all those gems and create top of funnel videos for you so that you can put them on your YouTube as well or send them to your list without any extra time required for you. And this is going to result in not only a great edited podcast, but also for every episode you do, like 15 videos, which you can expect to be growing your channel by blah, 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 blah. So like if you had that and you're like, even if your your price was two times more, three times more, whatever, like somebody could look at that as the, the why Brad is special kind of secret sauce. It's like, so layering on the bit you said about the marketing strategy, but also even zooming it back to being smaller. So not just totally like that consultant thing, but just saying my knowledge as a marketer allows me to strategically create top of funnel content. Because I can tell you as Zach from DYF, that's where I struggle is like, if I throw, if I throw a VA who's not a marketer at this task, they won't, they won't do it well. They don't know, like, they don't know how to write the hooks. They don't know what makes sense to pick as the, um, the gem. Like, it's just really hard to have a non-marketer do any of these things. And so you as a marketer really does make you special here. Uh, so I think that'd be sick. Like, saying don't just have these freaking podcast episodes be these two hour long things that only exist in one format. Every single one of these could be YouTube videos. And, and what's also nice about this is that like you can, so to me, again, I think social is a can of worms because it requires so much administration. It takes so much time to me, uh, to me. I know people do social and so surely people get an ROI, surely. And maybe I overcomplicate it because I hate social. But like, if you can think of, in terms of administration time that it's going to take you. If you were to just chop the podcast into YouTube videos, post them on YouTube, post the shorts on YouTube versus doing all that and also doing TikTok and also doing Twitter and also doing Insta. How much extra time does the social add? I don't know. Um, but that might be the basis for packages is that one package is mm. like podcast only. Another package is podcast plus YouTube um, normal length. Another could be podcast plus uh, YouTube shorts plus TikTok. And then another one could be like your, your fucking everything package where you do the podcast and every podcast you par parse it into YouTube and then you parse that into shorts and then you parse that into tweets and Insta and you design the thumbs for Insta. And if you can productize your pricing where you say every episode uh, that I do my whole breakdown for costs blank. So if I just edit the podcast episode, it's 150 bucks or 200 bucks or whatever. Uh, I can tell you, Paula, well, I shouldn't quote his price, but but yeah, whatever your price is, um, I know that people in general charge 
as much as $400. And then people often charge as little as 100. In my experience, this podcast production pipeline is kind of a pain. I'm not liking it so far. Like it takes a, a long time compared to just doing shorter YouTube videos. I, I don't know how people can make money doing 100 bucks. But anyway, like you could have your prices where it's like, it would be up to you if you would if you'd ever want a client who said, Brad, I don't want you to do the videos. I just want a podcast. Because maybe for you, in your opinion, the secret sauce would be the stack. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. So then you wouldn't have a, a package for just podcast. I don't want to be a or, podcast editor. I'm not yeah. I want to be some, yeah, the stack. So then that's what you the could secret do is, sauce. Yeah. I can 10x your views. Yeah. So then your thing is like, yes, I help you with the podcast editing, but where I really shine is like allowing your podcast to have a way higher impact than it yep. is now by living on different channels. And if you were to create, like you could consider it, I don't know if it's a good idea, but you could consider having a package that is podcast only that solely exists to show what a great deal your podcast plus YouTube packages. Like mm. suppose for a single podcast episode, editing plus parsing into YouTube alone, not shorts, not social. Let's just pretend for the sake of argument. Let's say that was 400 bucks or 300 or whatever. Let's just say a thousand. I don't think it would be a thousand because it'd be a lot, but it's easy math. So pretending it was a thousand. No, it will it won't be a thousand. So I'm not even pretend. So say it was 400 bucks. So then maybe your podcast only package is like 325 or 350. Like it's so close to it that they're like, oh, I should just go for the 400. Such a better deal. Like that's something to consider. I don't think it makes sense to, to launch with or whatever, but. Um, yeah, I think that that's smart for you to consider the, the, um, the upwork angle with that. I would still be interested to see this 12 hour experiment without that, but it, I mean, it's not like your current route is really kicking ass. You know, it's not like you've got a really great thing. So maybe what you could do is divest a little and say six hours, your current strat, six hours testing out this podcast strat. What I would love is if it was 12 hours, the current strat, six hours, the podcast strat with a potential repivot. If one's going really, really well, where you'd cut the current strat to six and up the podcast one to 12. But if you don't want to build that extra time and you're already having a hard time knowing if you're going to do the 12 hours of outreach. So, um, so if you're, if you're keen to not increase the outreach time, maybe do six and six and see what happens. But, but yeah, I think this is a really, really great idea that you have here. Yeah, I I would I would really like to work something out with you where it makes sense to you so I can just smash some of these beliefs you have cuz it's not that much work for like I take an hour long podcast and then I can parse it out into little pieces as I go I go through it one time which sucks. I don't like the one to one unit, you know, exchange. I do have to go through each hour long podcast at least once. Which mm -hmm. is a bummer. But in that time, I use the one touch philosophy where I'm like, I never want to listen to this podcast fully ever again. So I have to get all the clips from it right now. So, you know, it might take me five hours or whatever, maybe to pull out all the clips. Maybe it'll take me two hours. But after that, like, I don't see it as extra work to like, once I have the short, I take it from Descript to CapCut and then I make it all like cool Alex Hermosi and punchy and chop it to the hook and stuff. Um, and then once you have a short, it's the same thing on all the platforms. So the same short goes on TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. And so anyways, uh, but that's, that's my process. And uh, I just have to go through each content one time, which that's my least favorite part is rewatching something, you know, yep. one full time. But after that, it's just like, little pieces that I can pull out and they have so much impact, like those shorts, you know, it's crazy. So, um, yeah. so maybe I've seen some maybe, that are very good that I don't hate. Yeah. Like Th that's some... the thing. I also think you probably have very high standards as a designer and I can see like aesthetics are very important to you. So like I would be worried to work, <laughs> you know, I don't mind the design stuff so much. What I mind more no. is like the stupid bullshit content. That's like just a clickbait headline with no substance. But I've found some people oh. who do shorts really well where it's good content and it yes, it's FOMO hypey, 
but the content's not stupid. I was kind of feeling like I'd have to do just bullshit. And I know that you have your thing where you try to get a sense for how much bullshit people can tolerate. But I have found, I was, I was inspired to find some that were cool. Like I found, I saw one, I sent it to my girlfriend. I was like, is this what I have to fucking do if I want to do shorts? <laughs> it was like this woman like dancing and it was like top 10 places to earn money as a freelancer. And it was just like, you could be a UX strategist. She didn't say anything. She was just mm -hmm. dancing. And then another one was like, you could be a web designer. And it's like, that's a useless, useless video <laughs> that has just made so m much money for her. It's, I just hate it. Um, yeah. And I was like, is this what I have to do? Because I do I do feel that there's a chance that this kind of content creation can cannibalize a brand reputation. Yeah. Like if you think about brands like Wait But Why, where it's like he releases very few posts that are always really long and really good. You know his shit's gonna be good. Whereas this woman who was dancing, like, I don't have that belief about her. My belief is that, you know, maybe I'll get some ideas or whatever. But yeah, that's been where I've been a little bit stuck is how can I do shorts in a way that feels good? And I've I found people doing well. There's this dude who does like freelancing shorts who his things, it's like, it just dives in really, really condensed. He does all these like snap jump cuts and stuff. So you have to watch it on a loop, which is apparently good for the algorithm and stuff. Um, I see you drop something in the chat. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I, I understand you don't have to like this. I just want to show you what I'm doing with my podcast just so you can see um, an, an example of like how I've been cutting them. I'm not saying they're the best and I'm not saying that they're your style. They might qualify as junk to you, but um, these are some that I recorded myself yesterday. And then if you scroll down a little bit, you can see the ones that I'm pulling out of my interview with Dominic Kent. And they fit the format that's working right now on shorts, which is like these little punchy like headlines. Um, but yeah, let me, the let brand, me watch one real quick. Yeah, sure. So the one I should watch is the one a freelancing myth I held on to for way too long, that one? Um, actually, I would scroll down a bit to the, uh, maybe check out the virtual paycheck one. Okay. All right, let me watch that from the top. Yeah, I mean, this is cool. Uh, I mean, in, in the case of this specific one, I, I, as a viewer, feel a little bit confused because I don't know exactly what he means by a virtual paycheck, but that's semantics. The The style, I don't, I don't have beef with. Uh, but my question for YouTube shorts, and I guess this is where you can smash it, is like, I thought, not for a YouTube short, not a YouTube short, for a YouTube video, like a five-minute video, that if I were to just jump in like this one, like with a cold open like that, it might be confusing because people who are familiar with my face and Brennan's face on the channel, they would say like, who the fuck is this person talking to me? And that's mm -hmm. why I thought it would make sense to say like, hey, I just got off the interview with these guys. They run this agent. Like, let me give you an example. So I'm going to just pull up my fathom. But basically it was like, the five-step writing process, the, the title of the video would be the five-step writing process this $400,000 a co year copywriter uses. And so if that was the title of the video and you click play and it's a regular video and it just jumped into her to like Prerna saying, step one is writing, step two is blank. Like it, it felt to me too cold. And so what I did is I shot an intro where I just said, you're about to learn the five step writing process this $400,000 a year copywriter uses. This is from my interview the other day with Prerna and Mike Malik who run a $400,000 a year copywriting agency cut. And then it's just her talking. Like that to me, felt like important and worth my time do you do you think it's not i think it's important because it's your standards so like i always think it's important to consider like it's your it's your creation you know like you're putting your name on it so but i don't I mean think like you're i'm saying like let's say you had me on the nomad brad yeah and you just had a video where it cold opened with me talking and your face wasn't even on the screen, pretend. Like you wouldn't you wouldn't think that's a problem to just drop that on your YouTube channel. No, because I think as a consumer, this might be getting back to our earlier conversation. I do consume shorts and I think people at this point know what how they work and what they are. And like, if you see a clip that's clearly a podcast, people know what podcasts are. And so they're just gonna check out, they, 
the next step, if they like it, they're either just going to like it and keep scrolling, which is fine because you collect a couple likes, the algorithm likes it, whatever. Or they say, what is this? And then they go look at your profile and see like, oh, I'm a podcaster or whatever, or I'm a YouTuber. But I'm not saying for shorts. I'm saying for a straight oh, right. up right, channel, right. like pillar content. Um, Because shorts, I do 100% agree with you. It's only there to like capture attention, get a click to your channel. But I'm saying this person is already a subscriber to the Nomad oh, yeah. Brad. They're used to seeing the Nomad Brad. Now this pops up in their YouTube feed from the Nomad Brad. And it's just this Zach dude with no preface. Oh. That's, that's the situation I'm painting for you. I see. Yeah, you're thinking about your existing subscribers. You know, yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's good. If you're, How many subscribers do you guys have? I mean, we have like fuck all. But I'm saying... For your like, we have like two hundred subscribers. Okay, but most of um most of like right now we're pointing people to YouTube from the email list. But I'm just the reason I'm going through this exercise with you is I'm thinking about your client. So if you're gonna do this thing for your clients where you are going to chop a, a podcast episode up into shorter videos and then chop those up into shorts, if those shorter videos, if you believe it's valuable for them to have context set, what you will need to do is you will need to like basically have a 30 minute call with the client. So you've already called out all your gems you're going to create videos for, and you're going to have to have a 30 minute call where you essentially have your clients record these like little 30 second intros for each one or whatever. That's the only reason I mentioned all this. Yeah, I don't think so because I'm not really doing a podcast with my clients. I'm asking them questions. So by the them starting to talk, it's already like a good intro to that video. <laughs> so I mean, yeah, for, I think we might just be doing different. I meant things. for this service offering, you theorized that if you go on Upwork and you edit somebody's existing podcast episode, and then you're going to chop that into clips. I thought that's what you were saying. Yeah, I would probably just focus on short clips for podcasts. Actually, I, ah. I do, I do do uh, like these five to ten minute. I did that for one client who has a podcast, and they never really got a lot of traction because I, I do think I like your idea of like. You know, that that clip you wanted to make that was five or 10 minutes of your your interviewees system. I think that that is worth taking some time to like intro that and and stuff because you're giving like you're teaching in that in that video. But with this other client, yeah, we, they're just different formats, like the long form, like rectangle YouTube. That's mm -hmm. for just like longer form content or better structured or whatever. Those clips for my client never really took off. They would get like maybe a hundred views, whereas the shorts can get thousands and stuff. So yeah, I guess it's complex. I, I don't really think about it, but I kind of have these like different little buckets I'm putting everything in. So my current clients, I'm like, this this rectangle long form five to 10 minute video is gonna be like your pillar piece for this topic, right? That's what I wanted to do with you is like build out topical authority where you answer every single question about freelancing and that lives forever you know, as a search engine thing. But then from those, you can pull out short. So, man, I'm, I'm not communicating this very well, and I'm sorry. It's, no, it's it all in sense. my head, but... But that was what I... So, like, to me, the value, the ultimate package, in air quotes, would be if I have a podcast I already recorded, and right. that podcast is going to turn into that topical authority content, and that that topical authority content is going to turn into shorts. And that those yeah. shorts are going to turn into social. But if you're saying that that's not viable and that's, that's not high ROI, then cool. It yeah. doesn't need to be a service offering. I think that would be too much work on my part to try to make a free-flowing podcast into the topical authority stuff. I'd rather sit down with you and say, hey, for the next two hours, we're going to record topical authority videos, starting with mm. question number one. What is a freelancer's, you know, how, how should a freelancer charge per day? Right. What's your answer? Okay. Okay, then yeah, then that's cool. So then now you know when you're pitching this, that would be part of your service offering. But the kind of asterisk here is you have to ask yourself, if there's a client who's doing a podcast now, they have a YouTube channel with basically nothing on it, they don't want to have you do your other package, and they you're just pitching them on editing their podcast and repurposing it into shorts, are they going to get... Like, it would just be weird to have a YouTube channel with no, no videos and just shorts. But what it could be is a YouTube channel with podcast episodes and shorts and maybe that's all it would be that's what i'm doing i'm having one full-length podcast which takes almost no editing plus shorts 
and hopefully the shorts will push people back. I, I linked them all to the main episode. So far, that's not really producing much fruit, but the, okay. the shorts are, but you know, getting people, yeah, to watch a podcast they've never heard of is pretty hard, but I'll figure, yeah. I'll, I'll be working on that problem. Yeah, you're right. It, it is muddled and it's, I guess I'll have to listen to each potential client and see what, what they're willing to do or what works best for them. Yeah. Boy, yeah, oh I mean, that is the process. Like you're not going to, you were never going to come to today's call and leave it with a polished up service offering. Like the process is gradual honing based yeah. on what, what people find valuable and stuff. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing your thoughts as a, as a person who is creating content and does run a business that is looking for help with these things. Sure. So. I do so, feel like I've taken enough of your time today, Zach, and <laughs> thank you very much for sharing it with me. Sure. And thanks for being here. So for this week, do you think you'll do 12 hours on the old Strat, six hours on um, this new podcast single? Do you think you'll do six and six? What's what's feel like What feels like a good goal? Well, I'm just going to try to do 12 hours, period. And I think I have to expand into the adjacent niches, because if you recall from our YouTube strategy, there is a limit to how many YouTube jobs are posted per day. So I can but tap I thought, those out. What? I thought 12 hours a week did tap those out. Because I Maybe. thought you said last week when you did the six hours, you could have done twice as much. Oh, I was thinking of 12 hours. I could have done twice as much of just sending out looms on Upwork to potential people. I wasn't thinking specifically for the YouTube jobs. We'll see. I'll I'll try to start with the I'll I'll try to fill up the YouTube things. Okay. So I'm not sure about that. Okay. But I'll make a note. Six hours YouTube things, six hours podcast, maybe. Cool. All right. Well then, at this point, I will say goodbye. And we will cut into the outro that we technically shot earlier. But now you, the listener, will hear it in a second. So Brad, we will connect next week. I'll be quite keen to hear how all these slots develop and how the lead gen stuff goes. So there all right, we go. Thank you, Zach. <laughs> yep. All right. See you, dude. Bye. If you enjoyed this thing, you know, do the like, do the subscribe. It benefits you to like and subscribe because you're going to get more helpful stuff like this. And it obviously benefits me to get a good review on the podcast or whatever. I'm frazzled because I got to go fast. Uh, and yeah, again, if you want to join the Accelerator community, you can learn more at dyf.link slash dyfa, and it will be very similar to this. If you want to more learn more about Brad's business, uh, he is the Nomad Brad on YouTube. Brad, where do people go to even look you up on the internet? The Nomad Brad, uh, the, the nomadbrad.com, at the Nomad Brad on Twitter, at the Nomad Brad on YouTube. All right. At the Nomad Brad. <laughs> Cool. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, yeah, let's head off. And it seems like, Brad, I'll see you in like five seconds on the accelerator. Yep. So <laughs> thanks for being yep. here, everybody. And uh, see you in the next episode and see you in five seconds, Brad.